Hello and uh, welcome to MTN Teleschool. My name is Chimbusa Kasonde, math teacher from Nangongwe Secondary School. I'm so excited to be on this platform to help you, our students who are all taking mathematics as a subject, revise and solve many different problems in mathematics. Today, I will help you solve questions from 2019 Mathematics Paper 1 Examinations for School Certificate. And to do that, I've divided the paper into two parts, which will be covered in two sessions. So part one, or the first part, will cover um, a few questions, I think, from question one, somewhere up to question 15, and then we'll pick it up in the next session. So let's quickly go to the paper and start with question number one. So question number one, evaluate negative one, raised to the power 0, multiplied by 2 raised to the power 3. So question number 1 comes from the topic called indices. Now, at junior level, you looked at square numbers and cubic numbers. So a square number was defined as a non-zero number or a number raised to the power 2. So let's say, for example, we have x is any number and it is raised to the power 2. So x is called the base, and the power here, or 2, is called the power or an index. Power or an index. Power or an index. Now, what that means is that if you have x raised to the power 2, it means that you're supposed to multiply x two times by itself. So now, when we look at the question, we have negative 1 raised to the power 0, then we have 2 raised to the power 3. So a very important concept you need to take note of when you are looking at indices is that any non-zero number raised to the power 0 will give you 1. So there we have negative 1, which is a non-zero number. It is raised to the power 0. So negative 1 raised to the power 0 will give us 1. Then multiplied by... 2 raised to the power 3, it means that we are multiplying 2 3 times by itself. So we we'll have 2 times 2 times 2. And so we we'll have 1 multiplied by 2 times 2, that will give us 4. Times 2, we'll get 8. And 1 times 8, we'll get 8. So that is the answer for question number 1. All right, so we go to question number two. Question number two, the question is, solve the equation negative, uh, solve the equation x minus one, open brackets to x plus five is equal to zero. So when you look at this question, this is a quadratic equation. And so this quadratic equation has been expressed as a factor or as the product of its factors. So when you have two numbers or two factors multiplying and their product is equal to zero, it means that either one of them is equal to zero. So in this case, a quadratic uh, equation has been expressed as the product of its factors and those two uh, factors are multiplying. So that means that either x minus one is equal to zero or 2x plus 5 is equal to 0. When you have, let's say you have a times b, a times b, the answer is 0. Um, for a times b to be equal to 0, it means that one of these two numbers should be equal to 0. Let's say if a is 2, and then b, obviously, it should be 0 for the product to be equal to 0. Or if b is 4, then it means that a has to be 0 for the product to be equal to Zero. So that is the concept I'm using here. So uh, using this concept, we are saying that either x minus 1 is equal to 0 or 2x 
plus 5 is equal to 0. So solving for x, we are going to have x is equal to positive 1 when I transpose negative 1. And then solving for x uh, from the equation 2x plus 5 is equal to 0, we are going to have 2x. When I transpose positive 5, I'm going to have equals uh, negative 5. Then dividing both sides by positive 2, then I will have x is equal to then on the right hand side, when I divide 2 in, into negative 5, I will have negative. So 2 can go into 5 2 times, then remainder 1, then we maintain the denominator like that. So you can present your answer in this form or in any other form that is equivalent to that. And therefore, we can conclude to say x is equal to positive 1 or x is equal to negative 2.5 or any uh, value that is uh, equivalent to negative 2.5. So that is the solution for question number two. All right, so we move on to question number three. So I will be spending time on each question depending with, uh, with the, the, the tax complexity, depending with what is involved in a question. So we move on to question number three. Question number three, simplify for x squared plus 2y squared minus xy minus 6x squared plus 2xy. So when we look at this question, we are asked to simplify the expression. And so we'll look at the terms that are involved. You'll see that 4x squared and negative 6x squared, these are like terms. So um, I will collect the like terms. So I'll have 4x squared minus 6x squared. Then when you look at negative xy and positive 2xy, they are also like terms. So I'll also put them together, I have negative xy, then plus 2xy. Then I only have one term, which is in y, so I have plus 2y raised to the power 2. And so when I simplify this expression, I will get 4x squared minus 6x squared. So uh, we can first of all start by simplifying the, uh, the coefficients. When you have 4 minus 6, we are going to, because these are from different, from the opposite side of, of 0 on a number line, so we will subtract them and maintain the sign of a bigger number. That is what we always tell you when we are teaching you in class. So uh, that is the same concept we are going to use here. So uh, 4 x squared minus 6 x squared, that gives us negative 2 x squared. Then negative x y plus 2xy, that will give us positive xy. And then we'll have positive 2y raised to the power 2. Now when we look at these terms, negative 2x plus xy plus 2 raised to the power uh, y plus 2 multiplied by y raised to the power 2, you will see that these are unlike terms, so you cannot add or subtract them. So you can leave your answer at this point, or you can present it in any form that is equivalent to this one. So this is the answer for question number three. All right, so let's quickly look at question number four. Now, question number four, the question comes from the topic called sets, and um, we have the question which says, shed the complement of A union B intersection B in the Venn diagram in the answer space. I'll read the question again. Shed the complement of A union C intersection B in the Venn diagram in the space, in the answer space. So uh, we have the Venn diagram. I'll draw the Venn diagram. A, B, and C. Then we have the universal there. Then I will draw two more Venn diagrams. 
for illustration purposes. So I'll have the same type of Venn diagram, one, this will be case one, and then I will draw another one. So since the question is that we need to shed the part described by this particular operation, which is A, or the complement of A union C, intersection B. So the first thing I'll do is that using these other two diagrams I've drawn, um, I'll call this one diagram one, and then the other Venn diagram I'll call it, I'll label it two. So um, we have E, A, B, and C, then we also have E, A, B, and C. So in the first one, I am going to shade A union C complement or the complement of A union C. All right, so what we have shaded here is the operation, the complement of A union C. So I'm going to shade uh, the elements that will be found only in B. And so B, I'll shade the entire part of B. Now, since the operation combining these two, A union C complement and B is intersection. So in intersection set, we look for... Um, a common shaded part. We look for a common shaded part. And when you look at these two diagrams, um, Venn diagram one and Venn diagram two, you will see that in the first one, the outside part, which is the union set, which is the union, this part is shaded, but in case B or case two, the outside part, which is the union, is not shaded. Then when you look at the union of A and C or A union C, it is not shaded in the first case. And in the second case, we have just that small part there, which is shaded. I'll, 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 I'll use uh, red to show that the part in case, in case two, it is shaded. So the only part we can pick here or the only intersecting part is this part. I'll use the arrow like that to show the only intersecting part in both uh, complement of A union C and and the case of just shading set B. So the only intersecting or the only common shaded part is this part which I'm going to shade in the other diagram here, which is this part I'll use red to show. All right, so um, the operation complement of A union C intersection B is just this part I have shaded here using red and that is where the solution is, or that is where elements of the complement of A union C intersection B will be. All right, so question number five, factorize completely for A, B plus six AC minus six BD minus nine CD. All right, so to factorize a question like this, uh, we use the method called factorization by pairing or factorization by grouping. So what you need to do there is you, you're going to group or pair the first two terms, you put them in one bracket. So or in the same brackets, you say open bracket for AB plus 6AC, then you close, leave the sign. Um, from negative 6BD, you leave the sign outside and then you pair the other two terms. You have 6BD minus 9CD. So what we are going to do now is we'll factorize. We'll factor out the common uh, terms in the first part. So 2 is common because 2 can be divided in both 4 and 6. And then A is also common. So when I divide 2A into 4AB, I will get 2B. Then when I multiply the sign, which is on the term that I've factored out, which is 2A, which is positive, I multiply positive times the positive. Um, that is connecting the two terms there. I'll have positive. Then 2A into 6AC, I will get 3C. And then on the other side, there is negative 
there so i'll maintain the negative and then i'll factor out i'll look for a number that can be divided in both 6 and 9 without leaving a remainder so that number is 3 and then we can see that d is also common so i'll factor it out so when i divide um, 3d into 6bd i'll remain with 2b and then negative times negative I'm, I'm multiplying these two signs so negative times negative i'll get positive and then when i divide 3d into 9cd i will get 3c so then i will group the terms outside which is 2a and minus 3d and then I will just pick one term because 2B, uh, 2B plus 3C, these are, are just the same. So I will just pick one of them and I will have 2B plus 3C. So that is the answer for question number five. All right. So when you're given terms like that, where um, some terms have, um, have variables that are common, just remember that you are supposed to use factorization by grouping for example when you look at four uh, the first term there you have four a b then the second term as a and then there is c there we have the third term with six b d and then we have the fourth term with nine six uh, nine uh, nine c d so we don't have uh, terms that we can call they are like but we only have variables that are maybe in one or, or more or more terms. So there, to factorize that kind of equation, you use what we call factorization by pairing or factorization by grouping. So that is how you work out question number five. So let's quickly go to question number six. Now, question number six is from the topic called social and commercial arithmetics. And uh, the other question reads, a company declared a dividend of one quarter fifteen way per share. So we have dividend, dividend per share, which in this case I will call D P S is equal to one quarter fifteen way per share. Musalala has six hundred shares. We have shares, six hundred shares in the company. How much? will she get so how much we are looking at the total dividend total dividend and so dividend per share which is dividend per share is given by total dividend total dividend divided by shares or the number of shares number of shares so uh, the question is how much will she get so we are looking for total dividend so i will make total dividend the subject of the formula by cross multiplying and so uh, total will be equal to dividend per share multiplied by the number of shares and so dividend per share is one quarter 15 way is one quarter 15 way then multiplied by the total number of shares which is 600 so when you multiply 1 quarter 15 way times 600 you are going to have 900 and to do that in simple term you can just say uh, 1 quarter 15 way it's 1.5 so 1.5 you can write it as 3 over 2 and then when you multiply uh, 3 divided by 2 by 600 we have 2 into 2 1 2 into 600 that will give us 300 and 3 times 300 it gives us 900 quart so it gives us 900 so 1.5 or 1 quarter 15 way since we are talking about money times 600 we get 900 quarter which is the total dividend or that is how much musarara got as the total dividend so that is the answer for question number six uh, the total dividend there is uh, 900 quarter all right so we move on to question number seven we move on to question number seven. So question number seven, it has two parts. The first part, which is part A of question number seven, given that 17 plus M plus 27 plus dot, 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 
a consecutive terms of an arithmetic progression. Find the arithmetic mean M. Find the arithmetic mean M. The arithmetic mean M. Arithmetic mean. So we are looking for arithmetic mean. Now we are told that this series is an AP. Okay, it is an AP. So that is why we have been asked to calculate the arithmetic mean. All right, so there is no need to test whether the common difference exists or not because you have been told that it is an AP. Now, what I want to just mention is that, for example, when terms are separated by a comma, then you have a sequence. Okay, let's say if you have A, comma B, comma C, comma dot, 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 this is a sequence. And when you have A, where these consecutive terms are separated by a plus sign, then it is the same thing. Sorry plus sign it is the same thing but this is called a series a series so what we have in this question is a series the concepts still remain the same except that this is not a sequence it is a series so um, to find the arithmetic mean or to define arithmetic mean we are told that if a plus b plus c plus dot 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 are three consecutive terms then when I add the first term and the third term, then divide by two, I will get the answer B. And this B is what we call the arithmetic mean. So when we go back to the question 17, 17 plus M plus 27 plus dot, 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 dot. So by definition, we are saying that when I add 17 plus 27, then divide uh, the sum by 2, I will get M, which is the middle term. So, simplifying this one, or this equation and solving for M, so we are going to have 17, 17 plus 27, so uh, that will be 54. 17 plus 27, that will give us... Uh, uh, for uh, 54, so uh, for seven, uh, that is 14, then, okay, that will give us 44. All right, so we have 44, then divided by 2 is equal to M. So I will cross multiply to make M the subject of the formula. So M times 2, I will get 2M is equal to 1 times 44, I will get 44. And when I divide both sides by 2 to solve for M, I will get M is equal to 22. So 22 is the middle term, which is M in this series, and it is also the arithmetic mean of those three consecutive terms. So just remember that when you are given three consecutive terms in a series or in a sequence, let's say A, B, uh, and C, these are three consecutive terms, then the sum of the first term and the third term divided by 2 will give us B, which is also an arithmetic mean. So B is an arithmetic mean. So you should take note of that concept and use it when you are given consecutive terms. All right. So that is how you answer part B. So the answer M is 22. Okay. So we go to um, uh, the part B of the question, which is 7B. 7B, we are given a sequence. So you can see that, you can see that here, the terms are separated by a comma. So when the terms are separated by a comma, then we have a sequence. And that's why they are calling it a sequence, because terms are not separated by a plus sign, but they are separated by a comma. So you have the sequence 11, comma, 13, and then comma, 15, comma, dot, 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 dot. So now we are looking for the formula for the nth term. So the question is for the sequence 11, 13, 15, dot, 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 find the formula for the nth term. So first of all, we need to see or assess if at all this sequence is an AP or it is a GP. So how do you do that? So I'll first of all start by testing if it is an AP. And an AP will always have a common difference. So how do I find a common difference? I first of all subtract two consecutive terms. So I will subtract the first term from the second. In this case, it will be equal to 13 minus 11, which is also the same as 15 minus 13. All right, so 
d will be equal to 13 minus 11 that gives me 2 or if you subtract 15 or you subtract 13 from 15 you also get 2 so 2 is the common difference there so 2 is the common difference and therefore the sequence we are given is an arithmetic progression so to find the nth term i'll first of all write the formula for the nth term of an ap which is t n is equal to a plus open bracket n minus 1 close bracket multiplied by d where a is the first term is the first term d is the common difference is the common difference and n is the nth term is the nth term so since a we have been given from the sequence a is 11 which is the first term it is 11 and then our d is equal to 2 which is the common difference we are just from calculating and then n we are not given n and that is why we are required in the question to find only the formula for the nth term so substituting these values in the general formula we have t n equal to then where there is a i'll substitute with 11 then plus n minus 1 then the common difference is 2 so expanding and simplifying that i'll have 11 plus 2 multiplied by n i'll have 2n then 2 multiplied by negative 1 i'll have negative 2 so i'm using distributive method there to expand and simplify so then i'll collect the like terms i'll have 2n plus 11 minus 2 and 2n 11 minus 2 i will get positive 9 therefore the nth term or the formula for the nth term tn is equal to 2n plus 9 and so that is the solution for part b of question number 7 so question number 8 the first part there are two parts there the first part reads the transpose of matrix a is so transpose we are told transpose transpose of a is negative 1 4 5 and then we are required to find the matrix a we are looking for matrix a now before i talk about or i answer this question let me first of all just talk about um, a transpose matrix in general let's say for example we are given matrix m which is equal to a b c and d so a transpose matrix of m which can also be denoted by m and then raised to the power t it means uh, the transpose of m will be equal to now in a transpose matrix the rows will become columns so for example row number one will become column number one and row number two will become column number two that is what happens in a transpose matrix so um, then the transpose of m will be the first row which is a b will become the first column so it will be a b and then the second row which is c d will now become the second column which will be c d and we can call that the transpose matrix so to go back to the matrix m then it means that the first column will become the first row and the second column will now become what the second row that is what happens in a transpose so also in a case where we have a transpose of a which has been given as negative one four and five we only have one row there it is a one by three matrix so the matrix a the matrix a will then be equal to meaning that the first row will become the first column so it will just become the row will now change into a column so it will be negative one four and five and you see that the order will interchange the order of now this matrix will become a three by one and its transpose is a one by three so that is how you find a transpose matrix so the answer for um, question number eight part a is a is equal to uh, negative one four five and this is a three by one matrix so that is how you transpose a matrix
All right. So let's solve part B of question number eight. Part B of question number eight. There you have been given that one, two, three multiplied by matrix one x five is equal to matrix 24. And we are required to find the value of x. We are required to find the value of x. So this is matrix multiplication. Now, when you are multiplying matrices, you ought to ensure that the rule of conformability is um, up, upheld, you know. You need to ensure that the, the two matrices you are multiplying are conformable. What does that mean? What I mean is that when you're multiplying two matrices, you need to ensure that the number of columns in the first matrix is equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. So let's look at the order of the first matrix first of all. The order of matrix 1, 2, 3 is 1 by 3. And the order of the other matrix 1, x, 5 is 3 by 1. So in the first matrix, the number of columns is 3. And the, in the second matrix, the number of rows is Three. So when you have the number of columns in the first matrix equal to the number of rows in the second matrix, then it means that the two matrices are conformable, meaning that you can multiply them. So when you check for that and see that they are conformable, then you can go on with your multiplication. So now how do we multiply matrices? We follow the order row by column. So um, for the matrix, let's say I have one, two, three, one, x, 5 is equal to matrix 24. So I'm going to multiply and, the, uh, and how we multiply, I'm going to multiply the first term in the first matrix by the first term in the second matrix. So I'll multiply 1 times 1, then add by the second, by the second matrix in the, in the first column there. So then I'll have 2 multiplied by x and then I'll have plus 3 multiplied by 5 that will be equal to 24. Then I'll simplify the left hand side. I will have 1 plus 2x plus 15 is equal to 24. And this gives me 2x plus 16. 2x plus 16 is equal to 24. Alright, so now, when you reach at this stage, you can now just simply remove the terms from the, from the, from the brackets. You can say because these terms, the left-hand side, you have a one by one, and also on the right-hand side, you have a one by one. So that means that, or oh, by implication, we are saying that 2x plus 16 is just the same as 24, or is equal to 24. So solving for x, you have 2x is equal to 24. When I transpose positive 16, it will become negative 16. And then I'll have 2x is equal to 24 minus 16. The answer is 8. So when you divide both sides by 2, you have x is equal to 2 can go into 8 four times. So the value of um, x is equal to 4. And that is the answer for uh, question 8, part B. All right. So... Um, before I actually go to question number nine, let us uh, maybe just pause for a short break. Stay tuned. Okay, let me know how it goes. I will. I need to go now. And don't forget to check up on your brother. Ziva, mommy. I will. I really need to go. Nisa Chedwa. And also wish your dad a happy birthday. Bye. Ish, my mom. She never stops talking, but I'm not complaining because I love our conversations. And MTN's 777 Just For You makes life and communication so much easier, especially for a student like me, because Sydney Sevens are just yet. So with 777 Just For You, I get special discounted data and voice bundles that allow me to do my schoolwork with ease and keep up with the latest trends online. I get to call my friends family and friends plus there's also a gift folder to cut the long story short i talk more and browse longer <laughs> that's my mom 
I better video call my dad and brother before class. MTN gives you so much more with 777 just for you. Enjoy amazing day and night bundles, super fast 4G data bundles, loco nilaka and more. Plus, you also get a special gift from us. Simply dial star triple seven hash and select an offer of your choice. Sekerela, we are on your side. MTN. Hello and uh, welcome back. Uh, before the break, we solved uh, question number eight. And now let us proceed and look at question number nine. So question number nine. Uh, we have two parts there, and the first part, question number 9a, the first part reads, A number is chosen at random from the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Find the probability that it is a perfect square. So that question comes from the topic probability, okay? And so what we are going to do first of all is... We'll write the set. The set is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and we have 10. So probability of an event is given by the number of outcomes or number of times the event is likely to occur divided by the total number of possible outcomes, which is also called the sample space. So we are going to let E be the event, be the event. Now this event has been described there. The event is that is a perfect square, is a perfect, is a perfect square. Is a perfect square. So we are looking for perfect squares from the set of numbers 1 to 10. So you can see that the number um, the number um, of times we can actually pick a perfect square from the set is actually 3 because let's look at perfect squares from the set that we are given. Number 1 1 is a perfect square, and then 4 is also a perfect square, and 9 is a perfect square because this can be written as 1 squared or negative 1 squared because negative 1 times negative 1, that gives us positive 1. Or positive 1 times positive 1 still gives us positive 1, so it is a perfect square. When we look at 4, 4 can be written as 2 squared. And 2 times 2, we can get positive 4. Or negative 2 times negative 2, we can still get positive 4. When we also look at 9, 9 is also a perfect square because negative 3 times negative 3 gives us positive 9. Or positive 3 times positive 3 gives us uh, positive 9. So you can see that there are only three numbers from the set of numbers that we are given and therefore the number of times a perfect square is likely to occur when we pick or when we select a number only once it's only three times. In the first or when we pick we can pick a 1 or we can pick a 2 I mean yeah we can pick 4 rather or we can pick 9. So there are only three uh, perfect square numbers on the set that we are given or in the set that we are given. So n n e is equal to 3. And then n s, which is a sample space, we are looking at the total number of all the possible outcomes. So we have 10 of them. So s, um, number of all the possible outcomes there is 10. So meaning that probability of the event or probability of choosing a perfect square is equal to 3 divided by 10. So it is 3 out of 10. We only have uh, 3 chances out of 10 of selecting a perfect square from the list of numbers that we are given. So that is how question 9a was supposed to be answered, or that is the probability of only selecting a perfect square from the list of numbers that we are given. All right, so let's go to part B of question number 9. Part B, solve the equation 
8 raised to the power x is equal to 128. So this is called an index equation. So an index equation is formed when you have an index notation. An index notation is where I write, for example, x raised to the power n. So I have the base and I have the power there or I have an index. So this is called an index notation. Okay. So when you realize that the power or an index is, let's say, a variable, when the variable is an index, then we are talking about an index equation. And how you solve such, such equations is that you need to make sure that the bases are balanced. So what we know is that applying the rules of indices is that the number 8 can also be written as 2 raised to the power 3. And 128 can also be written as 2 raised to the power 7. So I will change these numbers to the base 2. So I will have 2 to the power 3 and substitute that with 8 and then raise to the power x. It will be equal to 128 can be written as 2 raised to the power 7. So they are applying the laws of indices. For example, if you have x raised to the power n, and then you are multiplying again by an index m, it is just the same as x n times m. So um, 3 times x there, we are going to have 2 raised to the power 3x, which is equal to 2 raised to the power 7. And when the bases are the same, it means that their index are also the same. So that will give us the equation 3x is equal to 7. And solving for x, I'll divide both sides by 3. That will give us x is equal to uh, 3 into 7. We'll get 2, remainder 1 over 3. So you can present your answer like that or in any form that is equivalent to that. So that is how this particular question is supposed to be solved. All right. So we quickly move on to question number 10. Question number 10. Question number 10 has two parts. So the first part, set A is equal to prime numbers less than 12. List set A. Set A is equal to prime numbers less than 12. List set A. So first of all, we need to define a, a prime number. What is a prime number? A prime number is a whole number with only two factors. That is one and itself. So when we look at the set of prime numbers, the first prime number is two because two has only two factors, one and the number two itself. So set A will be equal to the first number is 2, then the second prime number is 3, because it only has um, 1 and the number itself 3 as a factor. Then we have 5, 7, and 11. So these are the prime factors less than 12, because the prime factor is a whole number with only two factors, 1 and itself. So that is the answer for that, and I think this was a B mark. No method was actually needed for this particular question. It's just listing the, the number of, or listing those particular elements, which are numbers or prime numbers less than 12. So we have 2, 3, 5, 7, and, and 11. All right, so we go to part B. Part B, all right. So part B of the question, it reads the diagram below shows a sector A, O, B. The arc AB subtends an angle of 21 at the center. So we are talking about a sector there, and we know that a sector is a plane figure bounded by two radii and an arc of a circle. So we have been given that arc as, as um, AB, all right? Or we can also define it as portion of a circle. That is what a sector is. Then the question there continues, given that the area of the sector is 14.85 square centimeters, calculate the radius, and we are given that pi is equal to 22 over 7, or we take pi as 22 over 7. So first of all, let me draw a circle like that. So we know that 
The angle subtended at the center by the circumference of the circle is 360. Okay? Is 360. So, if I draw a sector from this circle, let's say I, I, I draw two radii like that. This is the center. And I call the arc, that part there as arc A, B. Then, we are told in the question that this arc AB subtends an angle of 21 degrees at the center there. So we know that area of a circle is given by pi r squared. So to calculate the area of a sector, which is a portion of the circle, we are going to multiply the area of the circle by the ratio of the angle subtended by the circumference, by the, by the angle subtended by the arc to the angle subtended by the circumference at the center. So what I'm saying is that to find the area of that sector, which is portion of the circle, we need to multiply the ratio of the angle subtended by the arc or the sector at the center of the circle, which is theta, to the angle subtended by the circumference at the center, which is 360 degrees. Then we multiply that by the area of the circle. So we are going to use that formula to, to find the area of a sector A O B. So area is given by pi or theta divided by 360 multiplied by pi r squared and then we are told that area is equal to 14.85 square centimeters then the angle theta is equal to 21 degrees and we are taking pi as 22 over 7. So substituting the values in the equation, let me call it star 1. Substituting the values in star 1, we are going to have uh, 14 square centimeters is equal to theta is 21. Then we have 360 degrees or 360 then multiplied by 22 over 7 and then multiplied by the radius which we don't know. So we are calculating for the radius in this case. So I'm going to simplify the left hand side. Let me use a different color. So I'll say 7 into 7 I'll get 1. Then 7 into 21 I'll get 3. Then I'm going to simplify that one further. I'll use a different color as well. I'll say 3 into 3, I'll get 1. And 3 into 360, I'll get 120. So writing that equation, we'll get 14.85 square centimeters is equal to 1 times 22 times r will get just 22 r squared divided by 120 multiplied by 1 will get 120. So I can simplify that further. I will have 14.85 square centimeters is equal to, so I will use a different color as well, 2 into 22 I will get 11. And 2 into 120, I'll get 60. All right? So, I'll have 11 R squared divided by 60. So, solving for R, I will cross multiply. And I'll have 11 R squared is equal to 14.85 square centimeters times 60. And I'll get... 11 r squared, which is equal to 14.85 square centimeters times 60. That will give me 891 square centimeters. So when I divide that by 11, I will have 11 into 11, it's 1, multiplied by r squared, I will get 11, I will get r squared, which is equal to 11 into 89, that will give me uh, 8, and then Remainder 1, so 11 into 11, that will give me 1, that will be 81 square centimeters. Now, to solve for R there, 
we can say um, R squared minus 81 square centimeters is equal to zero. Then R squared minus 81 can be written as nine squared uh, square centimeters is equal to zero. Then this gives us a difference of two squares. So you will get R minus nine centimeters like that multiplied by R plus nine centimeters is equal to zero. Then this means that either R minus nine centimeters is equal to zero or R plus nine centimeters is equal to, to zero. So solving for R, we have R is equal to nine centimeters or R is equal to negative nine centimeters. So now you need to, to note that R is radius, radius is distance. So because there is no negative distance, the value R is equal to negative nine will not be considered. And therefore there will only be one value for R here, which is R is equal to nine centimeters. You can also uh, use the method if you have R squared is equal to 81 square centimeters, you square root both sides, which is R squared is equal to the root of 81 square centimeters. So that square and the square root will go because the square root is the same as a power half. So half multiplied by two, that will give you one. So you remain with R power one. And then the square root of 81 there is nine. And then you get centimeters there. The square root of 81 square centimeters is just nine. So we'll not consider the negative part because negative distance is not considered, it, it does not, the uh, distance is not measured in negative. So there's no negative distance. You only consider the positive value, which still gives us positive nine centimeters. All right. So that is the solution for question number 10. All right. Okay. All right. So we move on to question number 11. Question number 11 is from the topic called Earth Geometry. And we have two parts there to answer. Question number 11. So the question reads, the diagram below shows the position of town A, B, and C on the Earth's surface. So you can see the diagram there, All right? So A is on latitude 60 degrees north, okay? A is on latitude 60 degrees north and longitude 20 degrees east. Then B is on latitude 20 degrees south and longitude 20 degrees east. And then C is on latitude 20 degrees south and longitude 95 degrees east. All right. So the first part of the question, if it is 0820 hours at point A, what time is it at C? All right. So we know that a complete revolution makes up 24 hours. Okay. Or it takes up 24 hours. So we are saying 360 degrees will give us 24 hours. So, how many degrees will make up one hour? So, we'll say one hour. So, one hour to x like that. And then we solve for, for x. So, you'd find that solving for x will give us x is equal to uh, 360 degrees divided by 24. And that will give us 15 degrees. So, we are saying that one hour gives us 15 degrees like that. So now, since we are looking at time difference from point A or between point A and point C, the first thing that we need to do is to calculate the angular distance. And the angular distance in this case, we'll use differences in longitudes because we are calculating time. So um, you will notice that A is on longitude 20 degrees and C is on longitude 95 degrees east. Uh, A is on longitude 
20 degrees east and also C is in the eastern side of the Greenwich. So because they are on the same side of the Greenwich meridian, which is on the eastern side, we are going to subtract those angles. So the difference there or angular distance or their differences in longitudes will be 95 minus 20, which gives us 75 degrees. So 95 degrees minus 20 degrees, that gives us 75 degrees. So now we are going to, to use the proportion one hour to 15 degrees. Then we'll say X to 75. Now that we have found the angular distance, which is their difference in longitudes, we also need to find their time difference or by converting 75 degrees to time. Using one hour is equals to 15 degrees. So when I cross multiply and solve for X, I'll have one over X is equal to 15 over 75. And so when I cross multiply, I'll get 15X is equal to 75, dividing both sides by 15. X is equal to 15 into 75. I'll get five, it goes in five times. It goes in five times, meaning that there is five hours difference, okay? So if it is 0820 hours at point A, at A. So when you add five hours to 0820, you are going to have 1320 hours, which is the time at point C. So time at point C will be equal to 13, 20 hours if time at point A is 0, 08, 20 hours. All right, let's go to part B of question 11. Part B of question 11, a plane flies from A to B at a speed of 400 knots. How long does the journey take if AB is equal to 4,800 nautical miles? So we are given that the speed S is equal to 400 knots, 400 knots, and the distance D is equal to 4,800 nautical miles. So, what you need to know is that one knot is equal to one nautical mile per hour. Okay? So, 400 knots will then give us 400 nautical miles nautical miles per hour all right so since our our distance our speed there now we can take it to nautical miles which will give us uh, 400 nautical miles per hour 400 nautical miles per hour then we can use the formula speed is equal to distance over time to calculate how long the journey took so, making T the subject of the formula, we cross multiply and we will have ST is equal to D and then dividing both sides by S, we are going to have T is equal to D distance over speed. So, our distance is 4,800 nautical miles and our speed is 400 nautical miles per hour, all right? So, we'll cancel the zeros, okay? And when I do that, four can go into 48. Four into four, that is one, and four into eight, that is two. So, it goes in uh, 12 times. So, that will give us four hours, okay? So, um, the journey from point A to point B uh, uh, took actually, or it takes 12 hours. Okay, so it takes 12 hours to move from point A to point B if um, a plane is moving at a speed of uh, 400 nautical miles per hour and the distance between the two points is 4,800 nautical miles. So we have 12 hours there. All right, as time taken to move from point A to point B. All right. So... Just before we wrap up, let me solve question number 12. Question number 12. Question number 12. All right. So question number 12. The length of a piece of wire is measured 4.5 centimeters. 
the length of the piece of wire is measured as 4.5 centimeters. Calculate A, the tolerance. Tolerance. All right, so we are given the distance as 4.5 centimeters all right so to to calculate tolerance we multiply the error by 2 or we find the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound so how do you get the lower bound and the upper bound first of all we are going to find the error since the measurement is 4.5 so to calculate the error i'll get 0 0.1 divided by 2 which gives me 0 0.05 as the error and therefore, the acceptable standard limit of errors will be 4.5 centimeters positive or negative 0 0.05. So when I subtract uh, 0 0.5 from 4.5, I will get 4.45, which is the lower bound, which is the lower bound. And when I add the error, which is 0 0.05 to uh, 4.5, I will get 4.5. 5, 5, which is the upper bound, okay? And so when I subtract 4.45 from 4.55, when I subtract the lower bound from the upper bound, 4.55 minus 4.45, I will get the answer 0 0.1, which is the tolerance. Or you can get the error, which is 0 0.05 multiplied by 2, it will still give you 0 0.1, which is the tolerance. So the tolerance there is 0 0.1, which is the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. That is for question number 12, part A. And then we go to question number uh, 12, part B. Part B there, uh, we are looking for the relative error. Now, relative error is given by the absolute error divided by the measured value okay divided by the measured value all right so in a case where you are given both the approximate or the measured value and the true value you divide by the true value so the error we are given error is equal to 0 0.05 so meaning that absolute error will just be um, the absolute error of the same error i have which is 0 0.5 like that so meaning that relative error will be equal to absolute error will be the error itself in these bars. So you can read it as the absolute error of 0 0.05 since we already calculated for the error. And then the measured value is 4.5. Then this will give us 0 0.05 divided by 4.5. So simplifying that, I can multiply the numerator by 100 and also the denominator by 100. So 0 0.05 times 100, that gives me 5. And then 4.5 divided by, um, divided by uh, 100, that gives me 450. All right, gives me 450. So when I simplify that, when I simplify that 5 into 5, I'll get 1 and 5 into 450, I'll get 90. So the answer there, which is the relative error, it will give me 1 over 90. You can just leave it at this point or you present it in any form that is equivalent to that. So that is the relative error that uh, for um, the piece of wire, which was measured as 4.5 centimeters. All right, so that is how you answer that question, which is question number 12, part B. All right, guys, so we have come to the end of our first session. I will come back to help you solve more questions in the um, next session. Um, it, uh, my name is Kasonde Chimposa. Goodbye for now. Sin de